I'd now like to introduce our keynote, Dr. Katina Sawyer. Um, Dr. Sawyer is an assistant professor at George Washington University, and she's also the co-founder of the company Worker Being. And you can read more about her in the handout with all speaker bios. I believe we sent that yesterday via email, but we will also be putting that in the chat. I first learned of Katina about five years ago when I was reading an article about Pennsylvania's rank of 38th in the country when it comes to conditions for working moms. Katina, who was then at Villanova, uh, was asked, what can Pennsylvania employers do to do better? Here's her response. I think that companies can offer family-friendly benefits like on-site childcare, flexible work schedules, floating holidays, and pooled PTO and sick days. However, I also think that organizations need to address the issue of gender bias and stereotypes dead on. They need to create an understanding that women may be facing unique challenges at home that may cause them to have to shuffle their work around more creatively or to multitask when necessary. When companies truly honor that we as citizens have a responsibility to support good, strong family units, they begin to recognize the work and life, that work and life are really mutually sustaining. I was struck by Katina's comments at the time and how she really put the onus on companies and organizations. I had to meet this sharp young professor, so I emailed her and she wrote back within an hour. And, and ever since that time, I have really benefited her from her thought leadership on these issues. It really was her research that challenged me to think about what the fund can do to help emphasize the role of companies, businesses, organizations, and leaders to be gender responsive in the workplace. So now, as we welcome back four years of our champions, both companies and individuals who've been active in creating culture, policies, and initiatives that show an, an understanding of what Katina was talking about, it seems very fitting to also welcome her to share her insights as well. So Katina, I'm happy to give you the floor. Hi everyone, thank you so much, Michelle, for that awesome introduction. Uh, I really appreciate it and I'm so happy to be here. The work that you all do is amazing and so needed. Um, and so I'm just glad to be a part of this and to see all you folks here uh, supporting the work that's being done, um, which is so wonderful and uh, helping so many folks. Um, so I am uh, going to share my screen now um, with you and hopefully this is going to work and you will see it. Uh, can you all see uh, this window? My slides? Yeah, perfect. Okay, great. So today I'm gonna to be talking about the attributes of inclusive leadership. And the reason that I'm talking about this is because I was uh, lucky enough to be awarded a grant from the National Science Foundation, which has allowed me over the last few years to study what it is that is actually encompassed in inclusive leadership. Um, Michelle mentioned that uh, I have a company called Worker Being, and through that company, we've offered over the years many trainings in the diversity, equity, and inclusion space. I also teach courses at GW on diversity, equity, and inclusion, and it's my primary research area as well. So I've spent quite a bit of time uh, studying these issues, and uh, my background is in industrial organizational psychology. So I have a PhD in IO psych from Penn State, and I also have a PhD in gender and women's studies. So sometimes people think it's odd to put the idea of sort of structural change, gender, uh, more sociological, and sometimes even philosophical ideas about uh, how gender shapes the way that we see the world and how others see us. Um, together with business, which, uh, you know, when I was going through graduate school, I was taking courses both in how to make businesses more productive and also kind of how to restructure society so that gender differences and, and norms could be uh, dismantled. And so putting those two ideas together seems a little strange. We don't often talk about them in the same space, but I actually think they make perfect sense together because gender has a lot to do with the way we work, how people view us at work, and how our work actually shapes the lives that we live. And one, one area that I find that uh, organizations struggle with is the area of inclusive leadership. And the reason for that really lies on, on the fact that academics, uh, individuals who are researching these topics have spent a lot of time studying and understanding what not to do when it comes to uh, DEI. So don't create a harassing environment, don't create an environment where there's uh, you know unequal distribution of opportunities, et cetera. But we don't know a lot about 
what to do. So I would deliver trainings on DEI. And at the end, leaders would be very interested and say, this is great. You know, I'm, I'm so excited about getting on board with this. Um, what do I do once our company is sort of at the neutral place? How do we move it into being proactively inclusive? And the research doesn't really have an answer for that right now. Um, and so through my NSF grant, I've been working to better understand the answer to that question so that I can both inform clients who are interested in proactive inclusivity, as well as students who often have this question as well. So that's what we're going to be focusing today for our time together. And so I'm curious with all of you, uh, if you might take a second for me and think about what you think inclusivity entails. So maybe we can do uh, a quick uh, chat function here and try to talk about um, what it is that you think inclusivity actually entails, or if someone wants to take themselves off mute quickly and just uh, share with me some words that they think uh, might be a part of what inclusivity entails. So if anyone here wants to throw something in the chat, uh, what you think is involved in inclusivity, um, I would love to uh, hear from you quickly. Uh, so throw your ideas in, just get some things going. Yeah, all voices are respected and heard equally. That's great, Tiffany. Creating a space that everyone can access and where they feel comfortable and welcome, wonderful. Actually listening to people's views and thoughtfully considering them, yes. Listening is not just about hearing people, it's also about making other people feel heard, right? Um, not judging anyone, creating a culture where everyone is equally valued being adept at discovering what each team member needs to be at their best. These are wonderful. Um, an environment where people feel welcome and have access to the same opportunities and resources. Yes, so you're all doing awesome. Uh, these, are, these are large components of uh, what I'm going to present to you. But the big issue of what I'm gonna present is that everything about inclusive leadership has to be behavioral, right? So how do we ensure that there's equal access to opportunities and resources? How do we, how do we actually lead meetings more inclusively? How do we make sure people feel uh, heard and respected, right? So we're gonna talk about that in a little bit, um, but these are, these are wonderful um, and certainly a, a big piece of the puzzle here. I saw the word, uh, the use of the word equality a lot Equality is part of the puzzle, giving everyone the same thing, but we're going to talk a little bit about um, the idea of equity, which is giving people what they need, which was also mentioned in here. Um, so inclusive leaders actually practice equality and equity, which we'll talk about. So glad to see both of those things came up in the chat. So I want you to think about a time that you might have enacted inclusive behavior. And then in the chat, I want you to think about has someone ever served as an inclusive leader for you? So think about times that you've tried to be inclusive and then try to think about who has done that for you. So I'd like to know just in the, in the chat, has someone ever served as an inclusive leader for you? And how did they do that? So what are some of the things for you personally that you've experienced over the course of your career? Um, in the interviews that I'm gonna be sharing some data from that I've conducted um, in this space, um, People have actually nominated these individuals uh, as being inclusive. Um, and so this is the exact question that I ask them to think about. Who has served as an inclusive leader for you and what did they do? Solicited input, gave job referrals, great. Yes, actually uh, advocating for opportunities is very important. Um, perfect, asking for your input. Um, anyone have anything else that uh, they have seen an inclusive leader do for them? Providing you with unspoken rules or expectations, yes. Uh, the political information that we need is really important at work and it is not equally distributed. Uh, get, gave a seat at the decision-making table. Yeah, opportunities, advocating, allowed me to participate in our recruiting program. Direct feedback, yes, so important also from a gender perspective. Um, allowed me to take leadership roles. Um, the president of the company made sure I was included and heard when you were in a minority position within the company. That's wonderful. Um, mentorship and being brought into the conversation. These are all wonderful. I'm really glad to hear that you've had experiences with inclusive leadership. And certainly this echoes a lot of what I'm going to be presenting today. So I'm glad that some of you have had these experiences. Um, if you haven't had these experiences before, hopefully this talk allows you to better locate these leaders in your lives but also to help grow these capacities within your organizations. So um, this is awesome. Thank you so much, everyone. Okay, so as I mentioned before, the reason that I embarked on this area of study is because I felt like we knew a lot about what not to do in the DEI space, but we didn't know a lot about what to do. So we have really good definitions of what a lack of inclusivity looks like. Um, and we know what it feels like when you're excluded 
right? But we don't know a lot about how to proactively create inclusive environments from a behavioral perspective, right? We know a lot about how inclusivity makes us feel. Um, so in the academic literature, a lot of the ways that people describe inclusivity is a feeling of belonging, a feeling that everyone is welcome, but that kind of begs the question of, well, how do I make people feel welcome? How do I make people feel that I belong? And also not just how do I create an area of belonging and welcome, but how do I ensure that that belonging and welcome extends beyond people who look like me as the leader? and actually extends to a diverse team of people so that I'm not assuming that what makes me feel like I belong or like I'm welcome is actually the same thing that makes everyone feel like they belong or they're welcome. So this is a really key important competency that we've overlooked in leadership because truly we don't know how to train people to be inclusive. So this is a missing puzzle piece that I'm working on to fill. So how am I doing that? Um, I actually did a pre-study for this where I interviewed over 50 individuals who are not in STEM to kind of derive some of the questions and behaviors that might inform the current work. In the current work, what I did was I interviewed 43 individuals in STEM, which is science, technology, engineering, and mathematics industries. And the reason that I selected STEM is because what I found in my initial study was that the individuals who were reporting um, these behaviors were often in industries who were further along in terms of their DE&I journeys. And it seemed that the behaviors varied according to individuals who were facing more barriers within their organizations to inclusivity versus leaders that were in organizations who for a long time had already been focusing on DE&I or already had uh, employee bases for a long period of time that were more diverse. Um, and so, what I decided to focus on STEM was because if we pick an area that has traditionally been less diverse, so there are much fewer, there's a much lower percentage of women and racial minorities in STEM than there are in other fields. If we picked leaders from these areas and their followers to explain inclusivity, it's more likely that we can translate from a more traditional field to a less traditional field than vice versa. So we don't want people uh, trying to enact behaviors that work in a field that's further along in terms of DE&I and then turn around and say, well, it may have worked in your organizational context, but it doesn't work in mine. So we're sort of starting with a more extreme example in order to back translate these results because it's easier to put these in place in a more in an environment that's already more inclusive than to go in the opposite direction. What we did was we identified individuals who are minorities in STEM um, and we asked individuals to self-identify as minorities uh, and most individuals that we found were identifying as either women or racial minorities. We also had a variety of individuals from the LGBTQ community. Um, as well as leaders that they nominated as being inclusive. So not only did we identify individuals in STEM who are minorities, but, and ask them about how have they benefited from inclusive leadership and what does inclusive leadership look like to them? But also we nominated, we interviewed the leaders that they nominated. So we asked them, could you give us the name of a specific person or people who have been inclusive to you? And then we asked those leaders, what are you doing? So sort of two different perspectives um, on, on the topic. Interviewees ranged in age from 26 to 68 with an average age of 47. The sample was 95% female and 66% white. So uh, much more female than the uh, United States population and uh, slightly less white than the United States population. Um, and the average organizational size was about uh, 26,000 employees. So large companies here. Um, and most of the individuals that we interviewed were really high ranking. So for leaders, positions ranged from CEO to CTO to senior director. And for followers, positions ranged from vice president to senior director to senior manager. Um, and the sample was split 28 followers and 15 leaders. Um, we transcribed all of the interviews verbatim and went through a very rigorous coding process where we identified themes across all of the transcripts that emerged from the interview work that we were doing. And actually from this uh, work now, we're creating a measure. Uh, so based on the behaviors that we uncovered that I'm going to present now, we're also creating a measure that you can use in your organizations to determine whether or not individuals are behaving inclusively and also to sort of calculate a quotient of inclusivity within your organizations. So um, that's sort of the next step of what's to come from our research, but I'll give you a, a look at the findings now. So first, something that emerged 
what makes someone an inclusive leader? So what were some of the experiences that actually prompted individuals to engage in inclusive leadership? So the first piece is that a lot of individuals had past experiences with inclusivity. So they had viewed themselves as having had an inclusive leader and a light bulb kind of went off that maybe that was a form of leadership that they would like to do better. We also found that individuals often had a working mother uh, who had uh, uh, struggled uh, to gain inclusivity within their organizations. And they looked at that as an opportunity for them to uh, pave the way for the next generation uh, to make things easier than what they saw. Um, and this was true for men and for women. Uh, having a working mother seemed to be uh, an impact uh, that, uh, or seemed to have an impact across gender. Um, and strong interpersonal skills. So a lot of these individuals had spent time growing their relationship building capacities through leadership development. So they were quite good at connecting with others. So uh, some leadership development skills more broadly can help build a foundation for inclusive leadership. And a lot of them had achieved position power. So in our sample, as I mentioned, these folks were fairly high ranking, although we think that some of these behaviors can translate to other levels as well. Um, but these individuals had the ability to shape not only uh, their interpersonal relationships with others, which I'll talk about that anybody could do, but they also had the ability to shape systems and the ways that systems worked. And they advocated for systemic change as opposed to just advocating for interpersonal changes. So let's dig into the behaviors. Um, I, I talked before about this idea of equality, equity, and justice. And I just want to take a second because I really like this uh, graphic that I found online. <laughs> uh, but it helps me in my classes and with clients to describe uh, these differences. And what we saw leaders doing in this sample was really what we see in the lower right-hand corner. So we can see in the top left, in a, in a situation with inequality, um, both of these individuals have been tasked with picking apples. In the unequal situation, all the apples are on one side of the tree and they're just falling into the hands of the one person while the other person's on the other side trying to wonder what's going on and why they're not able to get to any apples. In a situation of equality, which sometimes can be useful in the workplace but doesn't fix systemic issues, they give everyone the same ladder, right? So now you're heightened, everybody gets the same thing, but they're ignoring the fact that the tree is leaning towards the person on the left. So if we're interested in understanding these two individuals' apple picking capabilities, um, we're not really able to get a sense of how good of an apple picker the person on the right is. What we're really seeing is a product of the fact that the tree is leaning towards the person on the left. Giving them the same ladder actually doesn't help solve the problem. In a situation of equity, we might say, okay, looks like the person on the right needs a taller ladder in order to, fit, in order to reach the apples. However, there are still a lot more apples on the left side of the tree. So even though this person can now reach some apples, there's still a lot more apples for the other person and their apple picking capabilities are still not being fully reached. On the right lower corner, we see justice. This situation actually fixes the tree so that the apples become more evenly distributed. And now both individuals have an equal opportunity to demonstrate their potential at apple picking. So the number of apples in their basket now accurately reflects their talents and skills, as opposed to reflecting a system that leans in one way or another. And when it comes to gender, we know that the tree often leans away from women. And when it comes to racial justice, we know that the tree often leans towards white people and away from uh, racial minorities. And we could think about this in a variety of different diversity characteristics. And of course, all those characteristics intersect. Uh, and so uh, it creates uh, sort of compounding injustices that we need to write the tree for. So when I work with clients and when I talk to students, I don't want them to be in, uh, in bucket uh, upper left-hand corner or upper right-hand corner, giving people the same ladder. I want them to really think about how can we fix the tree um, and creating systemic change in organizations as opposed to band-aid solutions for injustices, which is what these leaders are doing. So let's talk about the behavioral definition of inclusive leadership. So there are three categories that came out of inclusive leadership from my study. And I'm gonna delve into each of these in a little detail. Practicing effective talent management, driving equity from the top down, providing inclusive mentoring and coaching. So with regard to practicing effective talent management, the first piece of this is that individuals were very open to providing access to organizational resources. 
They did not show preference for individuals who looked like them in making these decisions. They truly were thinking about what did people need to get their jobs done. People who worked for inclusive leaders felt that they could go to these leaders, tell them what they needed to get their job done, and that their voices were heard and that they were provided with those resources in an equitable fashion. So they also felt like if there were individuals who had been consistently getting resources and they had been consistently being left out of getting resources, that these leaders recognized the historic pattern that had existed in access to resources and often distributed more resources to those who had been left out of resources over time to try to right the tree. So it's not just that they gave everyone the same resources, they also recognized historic inequities in distribution of resources and tried to make up for those. They also provided support and open communication. These leaders frequently met with followers. They had standing meetings with followers where they discussed all kinds of barriers and um, uh, successes that individuals were engaging in in the workplace. And they had a very open communication style. So they made it clear that you know, as long as it was professional, there was no uh, topic that was off the table. So followers could come to them with issues about overcoming barriers in the workplace. They could talk about their career paths. They could talk about life issues. Um, so they were not afraid to uh, tackle issues of things that were going on outside of work. You know, you're having an issue finding childcare and that might be impacting your ability to show up at work. Let's talk about that. Let's brainstorm that. Let's figure out a solution. So they were very supportive and open in their communication style. And they also aimed to create consistency and talent management practices. So they did things like blind recruiting, taking names, zip codes, addresses off of people's resumes. They uh, encouraged individuals to uh, look more broadly uh, for folks uh, to fill positions. Uh, so for example, we heard I heard a lot about individuals pushing for recruitment at HBCUs or at uh, women's colleges, for example, to find individuals who are interested in STEM um, in, in a broader net, right? And they wanted to be consistent about when people were brought into that into the fold from the recruitment perspective that when they were being selected, that managers were trained to look at and to ask interview questions of candidates in a very consistent way. And they also built safeguards into the process to ensure that people weren't being viewed differently because of their identity as the selection process unfolded. So they monitored very carefully who was being recruited, how recruitment was being done, and what information was being taken into account when people were being selected. And they also took a look at ensuring that performance management systems were equal, um, equally, um, everybody had an equal chance in performance management, that ratings weren't skewing in one direction or another based on identity. And they also ensured that professional development opportunities were distributed according to talents and skills, um, and that they were giving an equal opportunity for people to demonstrate their talents and skills. So they saw themselves as sort of providing a soil for individuals to grow in and they equally watered all the plants. And then if one plant grew higher than the other, uh, that was a good, uh, a good uh, indicator that that person was actually the top performer, but they weren't neglecting certain plants and watering others. And then looking at how high those plants grew and thinking, wow, that's about their talents and skills. They were really ensuring that they were providing a fertile ground for everyone to grow and then distributing performance rewards based on who did the best in that equal soil, basically. Um, so that was the effective talent management piece. They also tried to drive equity from the top down. So they created formal avenues for enhancing equity, like employee resource groups, workshops or leadership development programs that were targeted toward minority employees. And they also engaged in a lot of diversity and equity and inclusion training and awareness raising. And they provided budgets for these things if they had the capability or they advocated for budgets for these things if they uh, did not own those budget lines. They also were willing to demonstrate courage, so they pushed back against other leaders or other individuals who might report to them when they saw bias. They didn't let it sit. So um, a great example of this, a very, very senior leader in a tech company was in a board meeting. Um, they were advocating for who should fulfill the next uh, very high level slot within their company. Um, and all these interviews are anonymized, so I have to be careful not to share uh, any, any identifying information. But basically, uh, he brought to the table a woman that he had been mentoring uh, for a long time who was extremely equipped to take on this position and was going to advocate for her to take on the role. And after he advocated for why he thought she was a good fit, another man in the room said, um, yeah, I'm sure you really like mentoring her. She's really easy on the eyes. 
and uh, distracted the conversation away from her talents and skills, which were the highest and most qualified of all the candidates that had been put forth. He said he knew, he recognized this as an opportunity to change the culture in the room. He waited an uncomfortably long period of time, paused, um, and said, what that woman looks like has absolutely nothing to do with this conversation. I wanna retract that information from our conversation because it's distracting from her talents and skills. We haven't made comments about people's appearances who are men that have been brought up in this conversation. And so I'd ask us all to not consider that and I would prefer no one to make a comment like that again. And he said there was a long pause and the guy that made the comment said, you know, I, I want you to know I was just joking. I realize she's very talented. And he said, well, I'd like us to be in a workplace where no one really finds that kind of joke very funny. And he said, the whole room kind of went silent and he felt uh, happy that he said it, but he wasn't sure how it went over. And after the meeting was done, he said he received multiple emails from men in the meeting saying that he, they appreciated that he made a comment because they also felt uncomfortable, but didn't know what to say. So sometimes breaking the silence and creating an opportunity for individuals to uh, recognize uh, that a culture shift is necessary can be just the thing that's needed to start actually changing the culture towards inclusivity. Um, they also encourage informal support for equity by attending ERG meetings, by kicking off trainings, uh, by doing things that demonstrate that they believe that these uh, avenues are important. Um, and they also are, are uh, encouraging other people to attend and uh, speaking about constantly the importance of DE&I in the workplace. And the last piece is providing inclusive mentoring and coaching. So they recognize that some individuals are more likely to be overlooked in the organization than others. And so they aim to provide targeted visibility for individuals who are less likely to be seen because they've been less uh, represented historically within the organization. So they provide exposure for minority employees by connecting them with high powered individuals. They make sure that minority employees understand their value, talents and skills by giving them clear feedback about uh, their strengths and weaknesses. They enhance their organizational knowledge and political access by giving them information that other folks might be getting informally that they don't feel these individuals are likely to be getting. And they really strive to overcome their personal blind spots and they're very open to feedback. So they ask for feedback about their inclusivity and the extent to which they could get better and grow. So uh, to, to wrap, because I only have a, a minute left here, um, people reported widely that inclusive cultures bring results. They, they said that individual performance, team performance, and organizational performance increases. The perceptions that you're best in class rise, which make it easier for you to recruit and retain great talent. And everyone is able to move throughout the organization based on their potential and talent. So uh, people report higher job satisfaction, greater commitment to the organization, lower turnover, and lower turnover intentions. So thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. I know that was kind of a rapid fire uh, talk on inclusive leadership. Hopefully uh, that was helpful. And if anyone has any questions for me about this presentation, you can send me an email. You can find me on social media at WorkerBeing and you can visit my website, WorkerBeing.com to find more information. We have a blog, we have a podcast, all kinds of stuff there, uh, which centers around employee wellness, but also DE&I as a component of wellness. Um, so I am uh, gonna turn it back over and thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Katina. Um, we do have time for a question. If anyone has anything that they want to um, send through the chat now, we, we can certainly make time for that. It was a lot to absorb, but I really appreciate yeah. <laughs> how um, concrete the examples were and, and how um, just, yeah, just to, you know, to be able to implement things that are, are really um, concrete and, and um, you know, applicable to a lot of different workplaces and, and organizations. Yeah, if anyone has a question, I'm happy to field question. I see some uh, stuff that popped up in the chat while I was talking about the visual. Um, I was so happy that someone found it. Oh, asking about is the study published somewhere we can find it? Um, that's a great question. We are working on publishing the study right now. So I have a preliminary version of it written up, um, but I can definitely let Michelle know when we're ready to release it so that uh, you all can have a copy. Um, the goal of the NSF grant is to ensure that there is widespread distribution of these findings. So the most number of people can uh, implement it in their workplaces. So uh, I'm sure that they would love for all of you to have it as well. Great. And Katina, I know that you um, 
have a podcast where I, I, yes. mean, I think that you tackle some of these issues. Do you want to, to you want to tell people how they can find that? Uh, yes. So my podcast is on workerbeing.com. Um, that's W-O-R-K-R-B-E-E-I-N-G, like a little B. Um, and, uh, and you can find episodes there about all kinds of DE&I related issues. Um, I see some stuff coming through in the chat as well. So um, the example was men to men. What about women to men? Um, so we didn't have a lot of men followers in the sample because uh, we had specifically targeted minority employees. Um, I mentioned that we had some individuals from the LGBT population. Uh, those individuals actually were women. So we did not have uh, very many men in the sample at all who were followers. Um, the ones that we had in the sample were leaders. So I don't have a lot of examples from my data of inclusive women leaders to men. Although I would assume that men who hold other identities that are minority identities would similarly benefit from as well as um, these, these uh, acts will translate. People talked about how whole teams really loved working for this inclus these inclusive leaders and benefited from um, their leadership regardless of their identity. So um, we hope that that will uh, generalize, but uh, there's uh, further studies or further research that we could do on that. Um, uh, when you have leadership that is rigid, not progressive, and not interested in professional development. Um, so one of the things that these individuals did really well was learn how to connect with individuals who had power and to advocate for the importance of these kinds of initiatives. They often tapped into the business case for diversity, equity, and inclusion, trying first to make the case for why this was good for the business, if they had someone who was rigid, and then moving into a values case as time went on. So often unlocking the ROI on DEI uh, helped people have those conversations. Um, again, these were pretty high powered individuals in the organization, but we saw their followers actually following in their footsteps and trying to enact these practices in their own teams as well. So individuals who had less power in the organization and what they tried to do was advocate, find champions and create sort of coalitions that then would present uh, the importance of these things to senior leadership. Um, and how this translates uh, to large companies, for, to smaller organizations, yes. So the biggest issue uh, is the budget right, in the smaller organizations. Um, but some of these behaviors cost nothing, right? Like being diligent about how your practices are creating or not creating equity um, is something anybody can do. Um, being open to your own blind spots, asking for feedback. Um, one of the things I didn't get into was running meetings inclusively. These leaders would take notes about who said what, and if someone tried to take credit for an idea 20 minutes after another person said it, they would say, oh, that's interesting. So-and-so said that 20 minutes ago, right? So there are certain things that you can do uh, to uh, run things more inclusively from a behavioral perspective that don't require budget. Um, and maybe some of these things that require more budget may be off limits for individuals with, in smaller organizations. Um, a lot of managers don't want to take the time to practice inclusion. Um, that's very true. So one of the biggest barriers and challenges that we've uncovered is a time and resource crunch. Um, and I didn't get a chance to get into how these inclusive leaders navigate that tension, but um, what they need to do is weigh the risks with the rewards. And often what they'll do is camouflage DEI strategies as other things, which I could get more into, uh, to try to create longer term change so that they don't get ousted from circles of influence immediately. So you can't come in just like, I'm gonna change everything here and expect that the leaders are gonna just like accept it off the bat. So they're quite politically skilled in the way they proffer these things. Um, and they talk a lot about navigating risks and, uh, and gaining rewards. And sometimes they have to pick a longer term, slower grow strategy than a quick win. Um, okay, perfect. That's all that's in the chat. I know I've gone over time, so I don't wanna hold you up here, Michelle. You're good. Thank you, Katina. That was excellent. Thank you. Thanks everyone. These are great questions and comments. Thank you. Great.